Hey guys, welcome to All Electronics. I'm Gregory, and today's kitchen time here on All Electronics. We are going to study the vacuum tube blocking oscillator. This old technique that were the standard for generation of clocks and oscillators using vacuum tubes. This is the first video of the channel about vacuum tubes and I want to thank you all the patrons of the channel because this video is possible by you. I bought a bunch of different vacuum tubes with the patron contribution. Thank you so much guys. We are going to see the circuit working here on the kitchen bench and after we are going to go to the whiteboard to understand exactly how it works. Prepare your coffee and come with me. Well guys, here you see the construction of the prototype. I'm using here a pentode tube connected as a triode. So we call this a triode connected pentode. I'm using a very common vacuum tube here, the 6E87 pentode. This is a high transconductance pentode and it's also a variable mu pentode. Or we also call this a remote cutoff pentode. We are going to study the differences in next videos of the channel. The reference for this video is this article from 1956 about blocking oscillators and I wish that modern articles would be so well written like this one here. The link for this material is on the description of the video and I also posted on Patreon. Vacuum tube blocking oscillators were the standard way of generating oscillations and also to generate pulses in a monostable configuration. What's very interesting is that the positive feedback action in conjunction with the magnetizing inductance of the transformer, of the pulse transformer, generates very very fast rising edges. And probably in the vacuum tube era this was one of the only ways to generate very very fast rising and fall time. The 60 volts power supply is powering the plate, is biasing the plate of the tube and this power supply is biasing the heating element of the tube. 6.3 volts. And this is the output of the blocking oscillator. This is the plate voltage of the tube. We are seeing a 2 microsecond pulse here with very very fast rising times and fall times. We see that the fall time is less than 50 nanoseconds. Very impressive. It is actually a little faster if we remove the 20 meg bandwidth limiting of the oscilloscope, but it's around 50 nanoseconds. And as you're going to see on the whiteboard, and as you're going to understand on the whiteboard, the end of the pulse finishes with this inductive peak generated by the magnetizing inductance of the pulse transformer. And what's very interesting, guys, is that the repetition rate is very, very low. So look at this. The blocking oscillator allows us to generate very, very narrow pulses using a very low repetition rate. And this is a very interesting characteristic of blocking oscillators. We have very short and fast pulses in a very, very long repetition rate. If we study the service manuals of the first transistorized HP equipments, you are going to see the usage of blocking oscillators using transistors because this was the common technology, the common building block was the blocking oscillator and when technology transitioned from vacuum tubes to transistors they were still using blocking oscillators. Very, very interesting. As you're going to see on the whiteboard, the pulse duration and the pulse repetition rate comes from a complex interaction between the grid capacitor, grid resistance and the pulse transformer. So it's very, very difficult to design very stable and very precise blocking oscillators. And this aspect is what created the transition to the multivibrators we know today. It's very important to note that the blocking oscillator is a relaxation oscillator. It is not a linear oscillator as the common Armstrong oscillator. The Armstrong oscillator is a linear oscillator that uses positive feedback to create negative resistance over a linear tank creating the amplitude and the phases needed to sustain oscillation and the blocking oscillator is a relaxation oscillator and it's called blocking oscillator because this is a common nomenclature in tube design. Blocking comes from blocking the conduction of the tube using a very low negative voltage on the grid, reducing tube conduction to zero. And this is what allows the blocking oscillator to generate very long pulse repetition rates. Because all this time here in between pulses, the tube is blocked 
by the very negative voltage on its grid. This is the pulse transformer. We have the grid capacitor and grid resistor here. I used here a toroidal core with bifilar windings. Pulse width and the repetition rate comes from a very complex interaction between the leakage inductance, the magnetized inductance of the pulse transformer, the grid capacitor, the grid resistor, and the characteristics of the tube. This is why it's very complicated to design blocking oscillators. So so guys, let's take a look in detail how the blocking oscillator function and the best way to understand it, I think, is to take a look on the grid voltage. So I plotted the grid voltage, this point here, V grid. As our magic is happening here on the grid, the grid voltage will be the best place to take a look and understand the, the blocking oscillator. So we have the construction of the blocking oscillator here. We have the triode here. Actually, it's a pentode, but it's connected as a triode. So I draw here a triode. We have here the pulse transformer. And here I draw an ideal transformer. Let's first understand the circuit using an ideal transformer. And after we are going to add here the magnetized inductance that will generate exactly the voltage we saw on the oscilloscope. I'm planning a video about transformers because transformers are a bit complex to understand the behavior in the circuit when we think about magnetized inductance, when we think about leakage inductance. And I will be very open with you here, guys. When I started this prototype here, I was not understanding why the waveform was this waveform here. And this created the opportunity for me to make a deep dive on how transformers work. So when I considered all the characteristics of a real transformer, I could understand the waveform. I learned a lot doing this blocking oscillator here. Grid capacitor here and grid resistor here. So this is very near the circuit we have there on the prototype. I draw here four points so we can understand each step of the waveform. Let's start here on the first step, step number one. And as the cycle repeats itself, of course, when we analyze the first step, here, we need to assume some initial conditions. You need to believe me. And the initial condition for step one will be, of course, generated by the last step. So we are going to understand fully the step one when we reach step four. But believe in me, let's start with the assumption that the capacitor has a very high negative voltage in the direction biasing the grid. So let's assume that the capacitor has a negative voltage biasing the grid and we can see that the voltage of the capacitor is in parallel with the grid is exciting the grid of the tube because we have a short to ground by the pulse transformer so we can see that the capacitor is actually in parallel with the grid of the tube we can think that this point here is at ground and this generates the blocking condition we have a very low negative voltage here let's say you have here negative 20 volts this point here and this negative voltage is sufficient to block plate current on the tube so the tube is not conducting because it is blocked by the very high negative very low negative voltage on its grid and guys a parenthesis here we are going to study vacuum tubes i'm loving this idea of using vacuum tubes we are going to study in next videos but you can can understand the vacuum tube as a JFET. So if you imagine that the tube is a JFET transistor, it's a very good approximation to use as a mental model to understand the circuit. Okay, we are at step one with a very negative voltage on the grid, but this capacitor is in parallel with the grid resistor. So the capacitor is actually discharging over time. And we can see this from the transition from step one to step two, that the capacitor is losing its charge because the charge is being dissipated on the grid resistor. So this is this RC constant here, this line here from one to two, is the capacitor discharging over the resistor. Tube is still not conducting, but at some point, the voltage here on the grid, the voltage of the capacitor, will reach a point where some amount of plate current will be start to conduct. And this voltage is called cutoff voltage. If the grid voltage is more negative than the cutoff voltage, the tube is not conducting, the tube is blocked. If the voltage on the grid goes higher than the cutoff voltage of the tube, plate current starts to be conducted on from plate to the cathode of the tube. And this happens here when the capacitor voltage touches 
the cutoff voltage of the of the tube and this is the beauty of the circuit now positive feedback action starts to occur look how beautiful this is when the voltage on, on the grid reaches the cutoff a small amount of current starts to be conducted on the plate through the pulse transformer the voltage here on the plate starts to go down at this point here so plate voltage is here plate voltage starts to go down because the tube is going into conduction but if we have the voltage going down here on the plate we can see that the pulse transformer is inverted so now we have a positive edge on the other side of the pulse transformer and this positive edge is coupled through the capacitor to the grid enhancing even more the conduction so a very small increase in plate current will generate a signal that will make the tube conduct even more and this is positive feedback action now the current here will increase the voltage here on the plate will be even lower the other side of the pulse transformer will be even higher and it will bias the tube even more into conduction increasing even more the current and this is the positive action of the blocking oscillator this is what generates this very fast rising edge here on the grid voltage and this is what generates this very fast fall time on the plate voltage because this fall time here is enhanced by the positive feedback action when the current starts to increase it generates a signal that enhances even more the conduction of current and this positive feedback action creates a very very sharp transition of voltage here on the plate and on the grid but of course if the grid voltage is sufficient higher grid leakage will occur what's grid leakage grid leakage is leakage from the grid to the cathode and this is very similar to the JFET where a positive voltage here on the gate will forward bias the gate source junction and this happens with the tube also if the voltage here starts to go positive let's say here we have now plus 5 volts the grid becomes more positive than the cathode and now the electrons can flow from the grid to the cathode so now we have a flow of electrons guys this is the conventional flow of course the electrons are going from the cathode to the grid but this is the conventional flow of current let's let's say it correctly now we have a flow of current not of electrons a flow of current from the grid to the cathode and this is the saturation of the grid voltage here this plateau on the step 3 is the forward grid voltage and it's now that we are charging the capacitor we can think about the grid as a very low resistance to ground now because it's forward conducting it's forward biased now all the current available here on the output of the pulse transformer is charging the capacitor through this path here through the grid so as the grid is conducting we are charging the capacitor and this stored charge is what gonna generate the blocking behavior that we saw when we started here the first step as the plate voltage on step 3 becomes flat because the tube is saturated it's conducting the maximum amount of current it can the transformer stops transferring energy to the grid side this current here starts to reduce and the grid voltage starts to become more negative so the current starts to drop grid voltage starts to go negative here and as the grid voltage starts to go negative this reduces the conduction of the plate current so now the plate voltage starts to go up and now we are going to create the rising edge of the plate voltage this rising edge will generate a falling edge on the pulse transformer that will enhance the cutoff of the tube as a signal going up here is a signal going down on the grid and now we have positive feedback action again helping to turn off the tube and this turns off the tube here okay but how we are storing charge on the transformer and why we have this very negative peak here on the grid voltage for this we need to use a more complete model of the transformer a real transformer made by coupled inductors present a magnetized inductor and it's commonly defined as the primary inductance of the transformer so actually a real transformer is the ideal model 
the ideal transformer that happens to only transform the current and voltage relationships between the four ports plus magnetized inductance. And this magnetized inductance is called LM, inductance of magnetization. And now it makes more sense when I told you that we were storing energy on the transformer. The transformer actually stores energy on the magnetizing inductance. This parallel inductance that happens to exist in all real transformers, in parallel with the ideal transformer model. At step one, we understood how it works. Here on step two, when the plate current is increasing, what's really happening is that we are increasing the current through the magnetized inductance and also the current on the ideal transformer. The plate current is dividing between the ideal transformer and the magnetized inductance. And of course, all the current that's entering here, the ideal transformer, is also going out here on the secondary. If it is a one-to-one -one transformer, all the current on the input equals the current at the output. So the plate current is actually splitting between the magnetized inductance and the ideal transformer that is actually connecting this node at this point here, reflecting the impedance from this node to this node here. And now guys, we are going to really understand how it works and actually it will help us to understand how a transformer works. This is why I told you that I learned a lot from this project here. When the plate voltage goes down, we have a constant voltage over the transformer and the constant voltage over the magnetized inductance of the transformer will create a ramp of current. When we have the positive feedback action and the plate goes down, all the current of the plate comes from the secondary of the pulse transformer that is reflected to the ideal transformer here. Because remember, the ideal transformer is not inductive. The ideal transformer is only modeling the transferring of power from the primary to the secondary. The constant voltage over the magnetized inductance will induce a current, a ramp of current. So the current on the magnetized inductance will start to go up linearly. Ah, this starts to make sense now. We are applying a constant voltage over an inductor. The current is the integral of the voltage. It starts to go up linearly. So the split current is going in this direction here and also inside the transformer model. And what's interesting here, guys, actually the magnetized inductance of the transformer is stealing current from the ideal transformer. And this is one of the... Uh, um, behaviors of the transformer from an electrical perspective that blocks the conduction of DC on a transformer. Because at DC, this magnetizing current would go to infinity and any available current would not go to the ideal transformer because the magnetized inductance would steal all the current available. This is very interesting. As the current is increasing, of course, the current here on the pulse transformer needs to reduce because we have a constant amount, a almost constant amount of current going to the plate. The plate is conducting its maximum amount of current possible. So as the magnetizing current increases, the secondary current decreases. Ha! It decreases because the magnetized inductance of the transformer is stealing the current from the ideal transformer. And this is what causes the end of conduction, because as the output current of the pulse transformer goes down, at some point it will not be sustaining the positive grid voltage here, because you are charging the capacitor, it will not be at some point very near when the current becomes zero. When the magnetized inductance is still all the current, the current here becomes almost zero and now the voltage of the capacitor appears over the grid. Very, very, very interesting, guys. And this blocks the conduction of the tube. Now that we have stored energy on the magnetized inductance, we're gonna understand this negative peak here. And of course, this negative peak at the plate will generate a positive peak. When the tube stops conducting, we have stored energy on the magnetized inductance. We don't have any more current on the ideal part of the transformer. And this current here will not stop conducting. The inductor don't want the current to change. So now look at this. This is very interesting, guys. 
the inductor, the magnetizing inductance of the transformer will force current to go in the other direction. Remember, before the current was going in. Now, the current of the magnetizing inductance will continue to flow and will reverse the polarity of the voltage on the primary. This reversal of polarity it's what gonna generate this very short and very high voltage on the, the secondary of the pulse transformer. Remember, we had positive voltage because the current was going in, but now the current is going out. So this reverses and this generates a very short, very high voltage on the grid. This actually helps even more to cut off the tube. This is why the fall time of the grid here or the rising edge of the plate voltage is very very fast and this is why the plate voltage has that inductive peak that you saw on the oscilloscope the negative grid peak and the positive plate peak is actually generated by the magnetizing inductance of the transformer and you're asking yourself when the current gonna stop the current gonna stop when all the energy of the magnetized inductance is dissipated and it, and it can be dissipated on parasitics of the capacitor it will be dissipated on par on the resistor it will be dissipated on the load that is connected here and it also gonna be dissipated on the plate resistance so this virtual resistance that is connected across the plate of the of a trial tube as all these impedances here are very high this current that's forced by the magnetized inductance of the transformer is able to create very high voltages okay because the current will not change and this current when it's forced through very high impedances generates this very narrow very very fast and very high voltage peaks and guys this is the explanation of how a blocking oscillator works well guys i hope you enjoyed this video if so please subscribe to the channel give it a thumbs up and consider becoming a patron of the channel to help me bring more content like this one here see you in the next video of our electronics